Okay, people, welcome to this VIP event and um, featuring uh, Matthew Cole and Kate Stewart. Kate is going to give us a presentation and then it's going to be followed by a Q&A. We're here to talk about their new book, Our Children and Other Animals, The Cultural Construction of Human-Animal Relations in Childhood. So obviously we're into sociology here. Kate is a medical sociologist working at Nottingham University in Britain and Matthew works at the Open University. Their focus is the cultural transmission of social values and they've been researching the subject of socialization and children for a number of years. You can find them in an AR Zone podcast from September 2013 and a recent podcast that they did with me, which goes under the name of On Human, Non-Human Relations or On Human Relations with Other Sentient Beings. Okay, Kate, thanks very much for yeah. doing this for us and take it away. All right, um, you were cutting in and out a little bit there, so I'm just going to check that you can hear us all right still. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Good. yeah, it's good, yes. Okay, we're going a bit Norman Collier here and there, so um, uh, hopefully, hopefully we sound clear enough uh, to no, you. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a cultural reference that no one besides me will get. <laughs> it's flown straight over most people's heads, probably. Um, uh, anyway, thank you very much for inviting us to talk about uh, the book again. Um, I'll talk through um, some of the key things that we cover in the book, just give you a... Um, uh, an overview of, of what we talk about and our approach to thinking about these, these different examples that we'll talk to you about uh, this evening. So the book as a whole then uh, focuses on the socialisation of the human use of other animals. So not only as resources of food, but uh, resources for food, but also as resources for clothing, sport, entertainment, scientific research and so on and so forth. So forth. Specifically, we're looking, of course, at the context of childhood, and we're specifically looking in the, at the contemporary West as well. And I suppose the key question in the work that we've been doing over the last few years is um, how is it that most of us are brought up to accept and reproduce these um, uses of other animals? Um, so um, the book then focuses on the socialisation, as I say, of, of the human use of other animals. We're uh, doing this by looking at the interconnection of dominant practices and dominant representations and how children, not only how children are important, um, uh, how animals are important in children's lives, but also how children are important in other animals' lives, uh, in their lives and particularly their deaths as well. So we do this firstly by looking at some uh, dominant practices through which children encounter other, other animals. The feeding of animals, uh, animal foods in infancy, selective exposure uh, of children to so-called pets, so-called zoo animals. And secondly, we, look at an, we do uh, look at an analysis of dominant representations of other animals in children's culture in literature, film, uh, toys, games, clothing, and so on. And on this slide that you're seeing here at the moment, we've got a few examples of the kinds of things that we looked at uh, in our work for the book. Uh, we look at toys and play. You've got, um, you've got the floor plan of Hamley's toy shop there. I'll come back to Hamley's in a little bit. Um, pets and pet clothing, and the parallels between that and children's clothing as well. Um, Educational initiatives such as the raising of animals by schools for slaughter and consumption. The picture that you have here is uh, of the sheep that was uh, bought and raised by a primary school called Lid Primary School in the UK. Um, fast food tie-ins, which is where our interest in this area uh, really began. That, that was kind of what sparked off all of this. And some of you maybe have, have read our, our paper before that we wrote uh, about fast food uh, tie-ins. Um, healthy eating advice that communicates uh, that animal products are necessary in children's diets. Uh, this example that's in the middle here um, is from a government sponsored website which teaches children about healthy eating, about how to put together a healthy balanced um, packed lunch. And uh, when we looked at this, we, we tried to make a vegan packed lunch on this. And it was actually possible to do it because you could have hummus as a sandwich filling uh, in your packed lunch. 
But uh, when you got to the end of it, this, this warning came up. I don't know if you, if you can read it on the screen there. What it says at the bottom, you've not got any cheese or yoghurt in your lunchbox. Remember to add some next time. So, so have things like that, have, have those sorts of resources reinforce the necessity for animal products uh, in the diet. And then also we looked at um, the, the little screen grab that's down the, the bottom there, the structuring of the appropriate use of different kinds of dead non-human animals for use in school uh, science in educational guidelines, which is what that's um, a, a grab of there. So as I say, by doing this, we're arguing not only for the sociological importance of other animals in children's lives, animals are everywhere, but to a very great extent hidden in plain sight from the perspective of mainstream studies of childhood, um, but also, as I say, the importance of children's socialisation in other animals' lives and deaths. And on that first point, that hidden in plain sight point, I don't know if any of you have seen today uh, the BMJ paper that seems to have been quite popular. BMJ, always British Medical Journal, always around about Christmas time, publishes some kind of quirky research, some sort of light-hearted stuff. Uh, and one today has been about children's films and the death toll, basically, in children's animated films as compared to adult films. Goes through the entire paper, barely mentioning that most of these deaths um, that occur in these are of representations of non-human animals. But that's just as an aside, if any of you have seen that uh, story today. So in this uh, book then, uh, I'll talk you through how we went about this analysis that we did. We uh, apply this conceptual map of practices and representations, which again some of you may have seen uh, before or may have seen an earlier version of that we published with um, before. So these are the practices and representations that construct the meanings that we attach to other animals and our experiences of them uh, in our culture. And these practices and representations, therefore, also profoundly shape the life and death experiences of those animals, depending on how we, as humans, position them according to these concepts on this map. And this map helps us think through how different practices, different uh, representations, can shift and interact in different contexts. When we first worked with and developed this conceptual map, we did it with a kind of a compass in uh, the middle, and I think the helpfulness of thinking of it in that way is not, uh, we're not focusing necessarily on, on the positions of these bubbles that are around this map here. They're not fixed positions. We're focusing on the pull of these different axes. Um, and in terms of what those axes uh, represent here, Along that equatorial line there, we're referring to the extent to which we construct other animals uh, as exploitable objects or as autonomous subjects or agents, perhaps. That uh, other line, the other axis there, the meridian, the extent to which different types of animals are sensible, that is, visible, audible, etc., uh, in our culture. Um, in earlier versions of this, we've talked about visibility and non-visibility, but we've, we've opened that out now because it isn't just about uh, whether we hear or not, uh, whether we see or not, it's about whether we also hear, whether we smell, um, all of our senses are involved in our awareness um, uh, of, of what, how other animals are being used and uh, represented. So we talk about sensibility and non-sensibility uh, now. And the basic theme here is that we tend to encourage attention and affection on those who need it the least. The relatively protected companion animals or cultural representations uh, of animals or the body parts of dead animals and not those who, in, who need it the most, those who are exploited or exterminated in, in like, if you like, the southeasterly zone of this uh, map. Uh, and to illustrate this um, with an example, it comes up with the next one. To put this a little bit more simply before we put the example on there, um, broadly speaking, these tensions across these two axes give us four zones, uh, roughly speaking. The relatively privileged, but by no means unproblematic, northwest area afforded most subjectivity and sensibility. The, the southwest region occupied by comparatively free living uh, or wild animals. The northeasterly zone of products uh, of our dominant practices, um, and in the southeast uh, death zone, uh, if you like, where non humans become those objects or are removed from our worlds, such as, um, uh, such as vermin, I guess, 
and, and vivisected animals down there. So hopefully here comes the example uh, of this. Um, so if we think about rabbits who are ambivalently, problematically uh, positioned in our culture, here they come. Uh, <laughs> This shows that these meanings and experiences are constructed, um, they're artificial, they're not natural consequences of anything to do with either, uh, with, with the rabbits, the rabbits themselves don't identify themselves in, in these terms at all. They're all to do with how we use and think about uh, rabbits according to these different axes. So at the core of a lot of the work that we've been doing is this conception of these different elements. We also, in the book, uh, discuss the ways in which the experiences of children and non-humans were intertwined with the social and spatial reorganisation that accompanied urbanisation and industrialisation. So the physical and conceptual movement of both uh, children and non-human animals, uh, and both of these linked to concerns uh, that were couched as moral or public health uh, concerns. So here the importance of place and space, as well as how we represent and think about uh, other animals and, ch uh, and children, where we place them as well, where the appropriate place uh, for both children and for non-human animals are, and for the appropriate places for the interactions of those two groups as well. So these pictures that you see along the bottom here, uh, during that period of rapid urbanisation and industrialisation, the removal of children from the so called inappropriate workspace to the appropriate school space, and similarly the removal of um, uh, non human animals from urban um, uh, um, livestock markets, uh, shambles, uh, places of slaughter in the city centre to uh, appropriate places for non human see uh, non-human animals to be seen and encountered, such as uh, city zoos, which flourished all around about the same um, time. And what we argue in the book is that these processes and how we shifted conceptually and, and spatially um, what we saw as appropriate for children and what we saw as appropriate in terms of non-human animals are entirely uh, interlinked or um, very entwined. Uh, and this quote from an article written, uh, I think for Strand magazine by Charles Dickens, um, uh, we think kind of illustrates this uh, very much. You see, uh, you shall see the little children inured to the sights of brutality from their birth, trotting along the alleys, mingled with troops of horribly busy pigs, up to their ankles in blood. But it makes the young rascals hardy. Into the imperfect sewers of this overgrown city, you shall have the immense mass of corruption engendered by these practices, lazily thrown out of sight, to rise in poisonous gases into your house at night when your sleeping children will most readily absorb them. Uh, and very much when we uh, looked at this, when we found this little extract here, this notion of poisonous gases uh, being readily absorbed by your children, certainly struck a chord in terms of uh, perhaps how we think some of these representations and practices get to work on children uh, in contemporary society. So we set that scene really with, with both our, our kind of theoretical approach, that conceptual map, and this historical perspective, we set the scene in the first part of this, uh, in the first part of our book, um, uh, covering those issues. In the second, in the middle part of the book, um, we have a look at different socialisation uh, sites. And I'm going to talk you through some of the examples of some of the material we looked at and, um, uh, from each of these four sites. So we looked at uh, family practices, so things to do with clothing and food, we looked at uh, mass media, so representations in films aimed at children, uh, cutie magazines, which is what the picture on at the right there is, that cultivate, cultivate affection for certain kinds of animals. Educa formal educational resources, um, I'm going to come and talk to this uh, educational resource farmland, which is depicted at the bottom. Uh, in a second, I'll talk about that a little bit more. And we also looked at um, digital media as well. So games, like the, game, the farming games that you get uh, on Facebook, those, uh, those sorts of things. So the first of these sites then is the family and the practices that are most closely associated with uh, the family. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we had a look at uh, Hamley's. This is the floor plan of Hamley's toy shop. Uh, in London, um, and this illustrated a lot of these themes uh, really 
well, we talk talk about Hamleys for quite a while in the book. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So part of the achievement uh, of the socialisation process is to associate effective attention towards other animals with human infancy. And as children age, affectivity is progressively uh, attenuated and gives way to the inculcation of instrumental rational action. Um, so what we see in terms of the kind of ageing that's represented by the rising through the floors of, of Hamleys is that you start on the uh, bottom floor with cuddly toys for infants and they gradually give way to representations of animals that are progressively more realistic in terms of how they look um, but uh, they become less, um, there becomes much less affectivity involved uh, in those representations. Instead, uh, the non-human animals represented on the higher levels of the store for the older children are manipulable objects that are there to be posed in their appropriate locations, especially farms. And as you'll see here, this is a picture of a livestock transporter that you can buy, a toy livestock transporter that you can buy at um, uh, Hamleys. So they almost become, the non-human animals there almost become props uh, in order to play with the settings rather than these much more kind of subjects, uh, focuses of a, a, a affection that the cuddly toys are on the ground floor. If you go up a flight again, um, you can, children can consume animal products in the form of milkshakes, in milk chocolate, gelatin and sweets. Um, uh, so literally as, as you rise to the very top of the, of the floor that consumption becomes um, uh, real rather than just represented or figurative. Um, so Hamlet's and many other examples like this also alert us to the instrumentalisation of children's affection for other animals. Uh, commodified representations of animals and not real animals are highly visible lightning rods for children's affectivity. And the denial of exploitation that's facilitated by these representations is extremely profitable for both the culture industries that produce them and for the more directly exploitative industries uh, that they so often associate with. We also looked uh, in this chapter on the family at um, uh, children's food and children's clothing as well. Um, and how um, from the very first uh, food that's uh, produced by anyone other than a baby's own, own mother aimed at uh, children, we see um, uh, the kinds of imagery that we identify elsewhere uh, coming through and starting. So, um, as in this example here, we see affectivity emphasised through the use of love hearts and cute animal imagery. All of the um, uh, infant formula milks that are available in the UK, as part of their packaging, will contain imagery either with a love heart or with a picture of a cute animal, or, as in this example here, uh, both of those. They're ubiquitous on, on all of these, as I say, all of these um, uh, formula uh, products. Um, and then as, you, as we move along, as, as children get a little bit older and we're starting to introduce gel baby foods, when you look at how imagery is presented on those, again as this example here, we see an emphasis of the animal product element of, of, the, of the supposed meal uh, that the jar contains, that um, the name of the product uh, aligns with a, a normal, a mainstream adult uh, meal. Um, and these are foods that actually the content of a food a baby jar is a, a jar of baby food, sorry, is, is primarily rice and vegetables, and rightly so. A, a weaning child's digestion wouldn't be able to, um, uh, to eat terribly, process terribly much else uh, other than uh, rice and vegetables at that age. They're introducing, these meals are introducing tiny bits of animal product. So there is beef in this cottage pie, but only a teeny tiny bit. But the imagery and the discourse of a meal based around an animal product is being brought in um, at this very young age, along with uh, all, the, again, all of this uh, um, uh, very much gendered imagery about, as well about affectivity. Mum's own cottage pie is, is what's on offer here. Actually, no, this is a factory's mush of rice and vegetables. That's, that's what's in the jar, accurately. So it's bringing in representations of something um, 
uh, that aligns with these mainstream practices that that rely on the use of non-human animals as food. So we also look at clothing. A couple of uh, pictures for you here on this slide about clothing as well. Um, and here we see um, uh, the intersection of age, of gender, and of speciesism going on uh, all at once. So for young girls' clothing, we see imagery very much associated with the cottage garden, pastel colours, uh, rabbits, butterflies, all of these kinds of things. Clothing for younger boys has bold colours, has animals, non-human animals we'd normally think of in terms of being uh, wild animals. I think just blowing his nose there. Um, and as both of these groups age, as both boys and girls age, we see fewer and fewer non-human animals represented on the clothing, especially for boys. Again, signalling, identifying this uh, socialisation process that we see reinforced in other representations elsewhere, that we associate a normal growing up with a, a moving away from these very strong, effective connections with non-human animals. And you see that represented very strongly as you look at uh, how a clothing catalogue ages. So we see both gender and age um, uh, moved forward in how other animals are represented on children's uh, clothing. So taken together um, then, uh, our analysis of the family as a site of socialisation focuses on the initial cultivation of the value of expressing affection for others through pets, through soft toys, all the while inculcating practices that depend on violence, on eating animals. Um, so where we're seeing representations and practices very much above that equatorial line there, but what we're also identifying is a spatial reorganisation that, that uh, we traced back through that historical process, as I said. So the domestic space is constructed as a secure refuge from non-human animal threats that dispute the human privilege of positioning other animals. So, for example, um, Matthew put this slide together and went a bit wild on the PowerPoint animation, so <laughs> foxes slide, flying all over here. It is magnificent, he's looking a bit ag aghast. I think it's a magnificent slide, but there we go. Um, anyway, so this example of the demonised urban fox who invades from her or his proper location, which should be in that southwest uh, region, attacks human infants, threatens the human uh, family space threatens and attacks companion animals who are thought to belong, like that, uh, that little kitty there, uh, in the human um, space. Um, even exploited pseudo-pets like backyard chickens as well, so space is a very important feature in all of this as well. Second area that we look at, um, mass media, killing and uh, cutification, and as I mentioned earlier, this is the area really where our, our academic interest in this uh, first uh, started to, to develop, we first started to work on. So we look at films and cutie magazines in the chapter in the book uh, specifically. Um, the Lion King, uh, isn't, we don't talk about it so much in the book, but I'm going to mention it here because it's probably uh, one of the key original inspirations, I suppose, uh, for this book. And if Matthew wasn't feeling so grotty, he would now probably uh, hold forth for about 10 minutes on all the things he hated. <laughs> About the Lion King. Do you want to talk about the Lion King, Matthew? And it'll probably make you feel better. Yeah, I can't. I can't resist this one. Um, <laughs> as, as, as Kate said, this was um, one of the first things that got us thinking about the stuff that ended up in the book. And in the book itself, we talk more about Puss in Boots, which came out three years ago. <clears throat> but <clears throat> a lot of the themes um, came from our um, us thinking about the Lion King. So I saw it at the cinema when it came out. Uh, 20 years ago, about reminiscing um, nostalgically about when I saw The Lion King in cinema and how how um, how much it affected me at that point as, as something um, you know uh, <coughs> something ideological um, was going on there. And this so this is before I might have just started studying sociology at that point, but I you know I wasn't a sociologist or anything. Um, I didn't have the conceptual tools to articulate what I was feeling, but I knew something was going wrong there. So when we came back to this um, topic all those years later, 
was it 15 years after that or something, when we started working on these ideas, I finally got my chance to have my revenge, my intellectual revenge on the Lion King. So <laughs> I gleefully um, uh, wrote about it in that, in that paper from 2009. <clears throat> so some of the things that we thought were going wrong with it, um, Elton John is certainly responsible, well, makes it my lyrics, doesn't it? But anyway, um, <laughs> he, he uh, sang the song The Circle of Life, and the whole idea of The Circle of Life, I thought, was, was just a justification for eating meat, really. So it's a way of smoothing over this uh, uncomfortable truth that lions eat other animals um, for the children in the audience to make that seem okay and non-threatening. But more than that, we thought, this was also about making eating animals seem normal and natural for the children themselves when they're going to have their, you know, Happy Meal tie-in burger after they've seen the film. <clears throat> and then there are a number of other things going on in the film that sort of fitted in with that way of looking at it, we thought. So, for instance, all the herbivorous or vegan animals, if you like, who are in the film are silenced, they don't have their own voices, they don't become characters in the same way as the carnivores, or the, like, especially the lions of course. And the actual processes of killing animals and eating meat um, aren't shown on the screen. Um, it all takes place off stage as it were. The only um, small reference to meat eating is when uh, the hyenas are depicted, well again this happens off stage, um, out of sight, but they it's discussed that they're going to be eating meat. <coughs> um, and so there's this process of identification between the audience and the carnivorous animals that gets um, put in place within the film. So the vegan animals are you know, un uninteresting, they're presented as a mass, so you get a stampede of wildebeest, for example. Um, so the outcome is that meat eating is seen as natural and just and normal and unproblematic and all that kind of thing. So. And we think this goes on in, um, well, certainly any of the, the Disney-type films that we've watched that have animal characters, and of course there is a huge amount of them. So as I say, in the book itself, we look, we look at Puss in Boots in a similar light and, um, and critique that in a lot of detail. It's like you're returning to your sit-back now. You don't really want to talk about Animal Cutie magazines as well. Well, OK. <laughs> Guilt-tripping me. But, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, so, so this, in this chapter where we focus on mass media, sort of half of it is looking at the uh, Puss in Boots in particular and, and films in general, and the other half is looking at this um, genre of magazines that we call cutie magazines. I don't know if you have something similar in Ireland, or maybe even these titles might be available, but I don't know. But in the UK, there are uh, four of them that we found that are very, very similar, and they're called All About Animals, Animals Are New, Animal Cuties, and Animal Friends. <clears throat> and they're all targeted to um, pre-teenage girls, very, very firmly not targeted at boys from the um, <coughs> excuse me, imagery and so forth. And they all share a, a number of things in common, which we've tried to sum up in these bullet points on the slide. So there's a lot of anthropomorphism, so a lot of the animals have kind of speech bubbles and they're saying things. Um, to the reader. There's a lot of infantilism, uh, by that we mean uh, the animals, nearly all the animals in the magazines are baby animals, infant animals, and there are these common motifs of sugar and hearts and flowers, this sort of girly, stereotypically girly um, imagery. So what we're arguing is that, taken as a whole, these magazines reinforce this idea of cuteness, both through representations and also through practices. Um, and to illustrate that, we've got a few quotes from some of the magazines here. So, uh, there's one feature that says, who wouldn't want one of these super cuties as a pet? They're gorgeous. So that goes next to some photos of some uh, uh, infant animals. <clears throat> so it's inviting the, the girl readers to you know, participate in that practice of pet keeping. And then secondly, draw a cute picture or send in photos of your gorgeous pets. So inviting um, girls to participate in, in transforming other animals into representations, cute representations. And then finally, all oh, this cutie kitten wants someone to stick this tummy. So with those kinds of examples, the animals themselves are, are, are kind of made complicit with this process and <clears throat> presented in such a way as to make it seem perfectly natural that 
you know, pet keeping is the natural order of things, if you like, and that's what one should do with um, these types of other animals. So, um, in terms of our conceptual map, the intention of the, of the reader is directed to these safe zones, conceptually. It's focused on, or as we've summed it up with this alliteration, kittens, cartoons, cupcakes and conservation. Hmm. Um, so you can see it. It's to yeah, pick it again. Pick again. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can see that being summed up on this slide here. So the animals in these different zones are kind of drawn together in these magazines. Um, and at the same time, the products of, of objectification, of exploitation, are also made highly visible. So we've used a cupcake with the love hearts on it to represent that. Um, because another common feature of the magazines is that they, they have recipes for um, cakes and biscuits, um, you know, sugary foods. <coughs> and these um, ubiquitously include animal products, of course, hen's eggs and cow's milk and so forth, gelatin and sweets. Now, some of the magazines have... Um, Three packets of sweets, which include gelatin, given away, you know, stuck to the front cover, that kind of thing. Um, the 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 uh, as a snow leopard in the bottom left, coming up from the, the sort of uh, uh, southwestern corner. <coughs> one of the magazines featured a, a, a flyer, an insert for the World Wildlife Fund. Um, it's an appeal uh, for the Amur leopard. And I noticed there's also been TV adverts recently about the same appeal, asking for people to donate to, um, for conservation, of course. Um, but, and the incentive for um, supporting the effort is you get a free cuddly toy, you get a free cuddly snow leopard, who actually looks very, very similar to this one in the in the picture. So again, it's the cuddly infant version that is, is the version that uh, hooks people in, hooks in people's sympathy, because that's what they've been accustomed to through all this other stuff that's been going on in these magazines, in the Disney films, <coughs> in, in children's clothing, and so forth. And also uh, in schools, which takes them Oh, to nice. Work. Nice link, Matthew. Thanks. <laughs> <coughs> well, yeah, he's just going to hook himself back up to his drip now. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit then about the next chapter where we talk about uh, education. Perhaps somewhere one might hope to, uh, to find a more sober account of human non human relations. Uh, but in fact, uh, the educational materials that we looked at uh, recalls and reinforces the lessons that children have learned so far in the home and the mass uh, media. Um, and nudge children, provide another way in which children are nudged towards acceptance of exploitative practices. And one of the examples that we look at in the book is this game um, and set of resources called Farmland. It's an online video game which was developed by the European Commission, um, claims to educate children between the ages of five, uh, 9 and 12 sorry, about animal welfare on a livestock farm. That's its, uh, that's its stated uh, purpose. Uh, and the website, when we first analysed the game, the website was translated into nine European languages. It's been translated into many more uh, since we first uh, did our work on it. And it's produced with support uh, from the Directorate General for Health and Consumers. There's a, there's a coupling of interests there. The Directorate General for Health and Consumers. So, uh, the game and the information that comes along to support the game uh, uh, also has things like downloadable materials for school teachers and pupils to use as well. So there are lesson plans and the resource books and workbooks uh, and so on. Um, so um, how the game works and how the resources uh, work, um, in, uh, first of all there are a series of web pages that prepare children for playing the games uh, in which they take charge of this virtual uh, livestock. Farm. And this here is the page for um, laying hens, together with a picture of Berenice, who is the uh, human who is in charge of the chicken run. Uh, not going to dwell on it too much here, the imagery of the humans depicted, but please, please do note it as well. And in fact, when we first analysed this set of resources, Berenice was very scantily clad. Uh, she's, she's covered up um, as, as more countries have become involved in farmland. She used to wear cut-off uh, jeans and she used to have a kind of tied white shirt crop top uh, as well. She's, uh, she's covered up much more um, now, but still there are some, um, uh, there's some really gendered imagery that runs through this. 
And there are similar pages um, uh, that run through pigs, broiler chickens, dairy calves, dairy cows. And on all of these pages, the messages that come along in the text emphasise uh, the food functions of the non-human animals, that that's what these non-human animals are for, but also the necessary guardianship of them by the farmers, um, uh, that that's for the non-human animals' own good. And we've drawn out from, from each of the different pages um, here, we've drawn out some of uh, the examples where we feel that those elements are emphasised uh, in the text that comes along um, with, with the material. Uh, we also looked at, uh, in terms of this notion of, of uh, guardianship, care and uh, food being what these non-human animals are for, we also looked at uh, schemes like the living egg hatchery programmes. Uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar um, uh, with these, where schools can buy hatcheries with eggs in them a few days before the eggs are due to hatch. The hatchery is especially designed so that they have big viewing windows for the optimal viewing of the hatching eggs. Um, and as you can see on this picture here then, uh, the children can see the chicks hatch. And then after a couple of weeks, the chicks either uh, remain the property of the schools and are raised on school premises or are returned to an unknown fate, um, uh, which all of these programmes are really quite vague about in the information they provide. They, they're returned to um, uh, the hatchery uh, company. And also, as I showed you the picture of uh, earlier, uh, these kind of um, care and kill school programmes where um, a, a non-human animal is, is raised on school premises um, and then sent for slaughter and in, in, uh, often uh, in, in some of the, many of the examples that we looked at, the products are then raffled at the school summer fete um, and so that children are encouraged uh, 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 to um, form a bond with these non-human animals but it's with the purpose of showing them where their food comes from. There's never any questioning of are these our food at all. There's never any acknowledgement um, that these uh, children themselves might already be vegetarians or vegans. Uh, and actually these programmes don't show uh, anything that children don't already know. That they're under the guise very often of, of showing children the full picture, of them knowing the full story about food production, but actually they cut out an awful lot of information and they very specifically and very explicitly never reveal anything about that southeasterly killing zone uh, in terms of our conceptual map that's always kept um, away uh, from the children in these, uh, in these programmes. So taken together, these kinds of educational experiences like living eggs and like farmland temporarily reposition other animals in the safer regions of our conceptual map, but the dominant exploitative practices go unchallenged and are in fact reinforced because any challenge to them, such as veganism, is largely absent from the socialisation process. So they disappear again into uh, that uh, southeasterly killing zone and those products remain uh, at the fore in terms of what is uh, sensible. Uh, the final example um, that we're going to talk you through is these examples of digital games that feature other animals. Um, do you want to talk about these, Matthew, or are you feeling too rampant? Oh, oh, I'm going to be stoic and <laughs> talk about everything. Um, <coughs> yeah, this, <coughs> we, um, this chapter, like the mass media one, there's kind of two things we focus on, um, one of which are, are sort of... Um, uh, handheld console games like Nintendogs, that kind of thing, um, which we weren't going to talk about tonight. But the thing we were going to focus on is, is the other half of the chapter, which are these um, digital social media games like Family Farm, Farmville. Um, there's lots and lots of them that are, that are quite similar, which some of you have no doubt have come across. Um, and we thought there's a few interesting things, uh, well, terrible things going on in these games. <coughs> One of which is that they seem to, they have this appearance of re-enchanting, as we put it, re-enchanting uh, human relations with uh, other animals by a 
again, making use of this sort of cute anthropomorphized imagery, so everything looks very friendly and, um, uh, you know, mutually beneficial and that kind of stuff. But what's actually going on in these games, which anyone who's played them will know, of course, is that it's the instrumental use of other animals that's absolutely central to how they work. Um, so if you can see the slogan on the left from Family Farm, it says, Family Farm where friends become family, but we've added dot 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 become money, because that's what's really going on. It's all about learning how to profit from other animals. So just some examples of how that happens. So these are screen grabs from uh, Farmville 2. <clears throat> um, and all of these games, uh, it's not just these farming games, it's now a very common model in the gaming industry, is that games are free to access, to download, or to play online. But then they depend on um, people using real world money to purchase in-game rewards and, and um, you know, things that give you access to higher levels and, and all that kind of thing. So that's how Farmville 2 works as well. So in this top left we have this example, uh, more hungry mouse to feed, your herd is, is lovable, so that kind of cuteness comes through, but pricey. So with money you make from milk you can afford to buy more animals, so it's a, you know, a very um, transparent celebration of the capitalist uh, commodification of other animals. <coughs> Reinvestment in business means exploiting more animals. And then the second example, um, we get a, an intertextual uh, link back to The Lion King. The, the cycle of farm life, which is very similar to the circle of life, of course. Crops and animals form a virtuous cycle that ends in coins. Let's go. So this is virtuous in the world of Farmville 2. You know, this is, this is virtuous action, exploiting animals. And then this last example here, down at the bottom, we have a an absolutely naked celebration of capitalism. Capitalism is king, they say, as it says at the end there. <clears throat> um, and another key feature of these games is that uh, other animals, even though they're, they're in this huge style, they are basically reduced to machines. Um, so these screen grabs come from another uh, one of these games called Family Farm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you can, oh, I hope you can see on your screen that a lot of these animals have got these sort of rictus grins on their faces. Um, so they're shown as being perfectly content in their, in their positions, but they absolutely stay in their positions. So in some of these games, the animals move around uh, within confines of the ranch or the farm, but in family farm, they stay absolutely fixed in place. So you position them on your farm as the, as the game player, and they stay there for all time unless you sell them. Um, but they're perfectly content to do that, so without any kind of interaction with other animals, without, without their lives um, containing anything whatsoever other than eating the um, feeds that you provide for them in order to uh, exploit their products. And the reason we put violence is invisible on the slide is because, well, it is invisible. So, for example, in this bottom uh, right picture, you have the sort of brownie coloured uh, cow and you see there's a little white kind of cube next to it. Now that's supposed to represent a packet of beef. So if you feed pasture within the game to this cow, these packets of beef appear next to the cow, out of, you know, just out of nowhere. And the cow just carries on munching away, you know, contentedly in the pasture. So it, it's, it's meat without death. It's like an absolute, it's the fulfillment of the fantasy of this whole, you know, dreadful system. Um, and the violence is made completely invisible. And then the last slide on these uh, games is um, the reinforcement of consuming animal products. <clears throat> so these are again from Family Farm. So hungry little Daryl there is, can already smell the salami and he's starving. Uh, so there are lots of kind of uh, what do you call them, missions, I suppose, within the games where you have to produce certain products to get you know, particular rewards. So in this case, you have to produce, in inverted commas, um, salami and sell it. <coughs> so, but not only is uh, consuming animals normalised, also we get this um, impossibility of... Oh, no, what have you done? <laughs> Sorry, I pressed the wrong thing. 
don't know what you've done. <laughs> Yeah, they can still see that slide. Yeah. But okay, I'll carry on talking. Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> you see in the, um, in the other picture here, we have these different kinds of bread, and they're all made with eggs and milk. So within Family Farm, it's impossible to have such a thing as a vegan loaf of bread, which is, you know, really bizarre. Um, so not only do they uh, normalise eating other animals, but they also perpetuate this idea that being vegan is, uh, you know, bizarre, weird, uh, in fact, more than that, impossible. So i just pause there while Kate gets us back on track with our mm. technology. <laughs> we might have to always through, hang on, there we go. It's all right, we'll be there in a sec. That one? Yeah. There we go. <coughs> There we go. Thanks. All right. Um, so yeah, to sum up what's going on here, we, we have um, the, by transforming exploited animals into these cute representations, the, the focus is again elevated above this uh, equatorial line, <coughs> and also the products of exploitation themselves become highly visible, because by producing these commodities within the games, that's, that's how you make profit, and that's how you expand your ranch and so forth and reinvest in the business. Alright, um, so in the final section of the book, so those, those examples come from that middle second section, in the third and final section of the book we look at the destabilisation of the socialisation of these dominant um, human, non-human relations and we look at vegan practices and representations. So these are practices and representations that aim for a reconstruction of children's relations with other animals uh, and include social support and advice for children um, and their carers. Uh, they include in educational initiatives, supporting alternative uh, mealtime practices and um, vegan uh, themed children's literature. And the latter in particular is, is a big focus of our analysis in this part of the book. So in different ways, uh, books like this, and there's a couple of examples on this slide here, uh, Vegan as Love and Stephen uh, the Vegan, which you uh, may be familiar with, probably at least uh, one of, uh, in one of those. So books like these then, uh, in different ways, help children to resist the mainstream socialisation process by treating other animals as sentient, as having rich emotional lives, as having social and family bonds. Um, or as being wonderful, mysterious and beautiful fellow earthlings. Um, and at the same time, they dethrone humans from their position of privilege in that northwest section of our map, if you like. They encourage humility, compassion and empathy uh, among the readers. And the power of this work is perhaps summed up uh, in the media controversy caused by the publication of Ruby Roth's Vegan is Love uh, book that's on the slide there. Um, and uh, I think mentioned before the, the um, article on the Daily, the Daily Mail that in horror proclaimed that it could easily, a book like this could easily scare a young child into eating uh, vegan. Um, and some of the other examples that you see uh, on here, um, we've got um, Adelaide School Speaker Scheme, we've got um, the Vegan Society's old book on uh, feeding vegan infants, um, information on alternative uh, packed lunches, um, but also um, we focus very much on children's own agency, children's own ability to see through these practices and these representations. The very few of us uh, were raised as, as vegans, that whether we see through these as children, um, as these two magnificent men in the middle of the slide here uh, did, those, those are my sons by the way, um, uh, or whether we see through those representations later in life as, as adults, still we have the capacity to see that through those things um, and reject them. So we conclude the, the book by addressing our shared responsibility to engage with alternative representations and practices, uh, to refuse to perpetuate the great betrayal of children's capacity for empathy and love for other animals uh, in this mainstream socialisation process. Um, vegan representation and practice can instead help children and eventually uh, all of us 
direct our attention and care towards all of our fellow Earthlings. And it can sometimes seem that these dominant practices and representations that we've uh, given you a flavour of uh, this evening conspire to construct a totalising, monolithic, invulnerable whole. And certainly there have been times when we've been doing this work where we've uh, felt that and where we felt disheartened uh, in that way. But ultimately we reject that and ultimately we drew and continue to draw hope and strength from children's own capacities to assert their own ethics uh, of resistance. As I say, either whilst in children uh, or beyond uh, childhood, um, like the many of us who likely grew up exposed to these re um, representations and practices, but who questioned and ultimately rejected them. So we hope our work reminds us of how precarious these processes are, not how universal and monolithic they are, um, how delicate they are, how important their sociological deconstruction is to dismantling them, and last but not least, how our children, uh, um, figuratively in our use of that uh, phrase in our title, and literally on this slide, as I say, those are my children there, um, how our children themselves can and do see through these constructions. Uh, and can and do reject them. So in that spirit, we're going to um, end this talk with a quotation from uh, Donald Watson, who we uh, all know, one of the founders of the Vegan Society and coiner of the word, word vegan in 1944. Um, and in this quote, he reflects on witnessing the slaughter of a pig as a young boy, and he demonstrates what can be achieved by one child's contestation and refusal of this socialisation process. The thing that shocked me, along with the chief impact of the whole setup, was that my uncle George, of whom I thought very highly, was part of the crew, and I suppose at that point I decided that farms and uncles had to be reassessed. They weren't all they seemed to be on the face of it, to a little hitherto uninformed boy. And it followed that this idyllic scene was nothing more than death row, a death row where every creature's days were numbered by the point at which it was no longer of service to human beings. And quite early in life, I came to the conclusion that if I was to report on man's progress, I had to settle for the comment beloved of school teachers could do better. And from that, the Vegan Society was formed. Thank you very much. Thank you.